say to the students tonight, um, uh, I really like seeing you up here singing. Isn't that great? Uh, I said, isn't that great? Amen. Students, don't underestimate your contribution to a worship service. You're not the church of tomorrow. You're the church of today. And I praise God for you so very much. If you have your copy of the Word of God, would you find Matthew chapter 24? Matthew chapter 24, the most serious Bible student knows where we're going tonight. Let me just tell you, about three weeks ago, had some guys around where I live, friends for a long, long time, called and said, hey man, let's get up for lunch. And I didn't know that it was going to turn into about a two and a half hour Bible study, and that's about what it, what it did. And I was the only preacher there, and my friends began the conversation something like this, Brother Ron, with this coronavirus thing, is Jesus coming? Is this it? And I said, uh, uh, whether the coronavirus came or not, Jesus is still coming. And uh, we talked for two and a half hours. But can I just share with you, long after this revival is over, what an awesome opportunity we have to share Jesus during these times. I mean, folks, we've got the answer, not because we're somebody important, but we've got the answer, and the world out there doesn't know the answer, and we need to give it to them. And what a glorious, wonderful day, an opportunity it is. That's what I want to preach tonight about. I want to preach a message because, Pastor, right after that Bible study, I went home and I went to the chapter that I think is the greatest chapter in the life of the soon return of Christ and um, put together this sermon. And I've never preached it before, and, and so let's just uh, be excited about what we're going to learn tonight. Matthew chapter 24, would you find verse number 40, verse number 40, and would you stand to your feet and honor the reader, reading of the Word of God, and would you leave your Bibles open there as we will stay in the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 40, then two men, look at the drama, this passage, then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. Those words mean stand ready. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. I'm preaching on this subject. He's still coming. Would you be seated all over the building with your Bibles open in your laps? I love the story of the high school football player that wasn't doing very well with his grades. In fact, the coach sat him down one day and said, Son, you got to do better than that. I don't know if you know what the rules are in the district, but let me tell you my rules. My rules are I'm going to give you a couple more weeks to bring your grades up, or I will sit you on the bench and you can't play. Well, that's all that football player needed to hear. And all of a sudden, all of his grades improved, except in geometry. You know, I can relate. Pastor, I took two foreign subjects foreign courses in high school, Spanish and geometry. Can I get a witness? Amen. And I'm telling you, man, he was having trouble with geometry. And then it dawned on the old high school jock that sitting next to him was the smartest young man in the school, soon to be the high school valedictorian. So you know what he decided to do. Yeah, you know the rest of that story. He decided to steal answers off of his test papers. But it was the only problem with the high school jock. He didn't just get a little better in his grades in geometry. He began to ace every test, and the teacher was very suspicious. And so she decided to set him up. She gave the class an exam. And on one of the questions, it was number 15 on the exam, she gave an impossible answer. In fact, there was no answer to be found. And so when she got the test results back, she knew the old boy was hard that he had cheated because here's what happened. When she got the test results back, the high school valedictorian put for number 15, teacher, I can honestly tell you, I do not know the answer. And for number 15, the high school football player put me neither. <laughs> Called him. <laughs> Dead to rights, man. I believe there's going to be trouble at the high school football player's house. 
Can I tell you there's trouble at another house tonight? It's the famous one at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue called the White House. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't care how you voted. I don't care what side of the aisle that you're sitting on. I don't care whose fault you think it is. The Democrats or the Republicans, America is in a mess today. Do you know the White House resembles a fight house? The political landscape looks like a reality TV show more than it does a government. And the American family is fearing out hate through racism and the loaded gun. All the while, we got this pandemic called the coronavirus that has infected, are you ready, almost 22 million people worldwide and has taken 168,000 people's lives. It's a pandemic that has shut our country down or at least slowed it up very bit. We have a lot of trouble in this country, although we got some good news about three weeks ago, didn't we? Kanye West is running for president of the United States. Boy, I'm relieved, aren't you? Boy, that's a ray of hope, isn't it? Can I just get a little political, and this is the as political as I'm going to get all night? I think I'm going to look for Jesus in November because America's hope is in D.C., it's J.C., amen. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to get political with this next statement, but I'm going to get biblical. I think somebody's coming, don't you? Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to step out in the cloud and there'll be a shout. There'll be a trumpet sound and a voice. And a voice, that same voice of authority that told Lazarus to come forth from the grave is going to tell the church, the bride of Jesus, to come forth from the earth. And after the graves open up and the dead in Christ rise, then everybody else that remains that knows Jesus as Lord and Savior will take off like a rock to meet Jesus in the air. Hallelujah. Now, speaking of graves, my wife and I do not have any cemetery plots to be buried in. Brother Keith, she gets on to me all the time. Run, let's go shopping for some cemetery grave plots. Now, can I just tell you why I don't have any? First of all, I don't like to go shopping in general. Amen, guys. Amen. Amen. Especially to go shop for a hole I'm going to be buried in. Can I get a witness? In fact, you know what? My wife tried to get me to go last fall with her. Let's go grave plot shopping in the fall on a Saturday. Oh, yeah, I'm going to forfeit my day at the swamp, yeah? I'm going to forfeit watching college football on TV to go grave plot shopping. I finally told her, I said, honey, guess what? I don't want one because I don't think I'm going to need one. I believe I'm going to fly away before I pass away. Like the old country preacher said one day, I plan on seeing the upper taker long before I see the undertaker. But I got news for you. If it doesn't happen that way, guess what? I'm still going and Jesus is still coming. Do you know that 27% of your Bible is about eschatology? The study of the future. The study of end things. Do you know that 318 times in the New Testament does it mention that Jesus is going to come again? It only has to say it one time for it to be true. And Brother Keith, it says it 318 times. By the way, in 23 of the 27 New Testament book. And did you know that for every one prophecy that said that Jesus was coming as a baby in a manger, and he did, there are eight prophecies that says that Jesus is coming to earth again. I don't know about you, but ladies and gentlemen, how blessed we are to have this book. Information written thousands of years ago that prepares us not only how to live today, but what we must do about tomorrow. And that's what I want to do for a few moments in this house tonight. I don't know where everybody in the building saved, or I don't know if there's a few lost folks in the building, but guess what? It doesn't matter because there are only two kinds of people in the building tonight. You say, well, Brother Ron, that's good. I'm glad you know that. There's a male and a female. All I know that, but I'm talking about there's only two kinds of people. Either you know Christ is your Savior, or you don't know Christ is your Savior. But either way, the soon return... Jesus Christ had something to say to both of us. How to prepare to live during these difficult days and how to prepare for tomorrow in light of the great news that Jesus is coming again. So, from this great chapter, 
In Matthew chapter 24, I want to look at some reminders. You might have heard this all of your Christian life. You might have heard this all of your life as a student of the Bible, but we all can use a review, and I'm going to call this Pastor or Prophecy 101 Review to look at who is coming. Somebody's coming. And let's find out who he is in light of these dark days. Let's talk about it. First of all, the truth about the soon return of Christ. Number one is nobody knows when he's coming. Now, I know that's on the screen, but I'm going to say it again. Watch this. Jesus is coming again, and nobody knows when. We didn't read verse number 36 a moment ago. Look at that 36 verse. It sounded a lot like the 42nd verse that we read a moment ago. Look what verse 36 says. But of that day and hour. No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. You know, that's pretty plain, ain't it, brother? I mean, that's how you say it up here in Swanee County, isn't it? I mean, that's plain. Those nine words, nobody knows. Nobody knows. No one knows when he's coming. And then we read that in verse 42, and then in verse 43. It gives us all a simple illustration that all of us abide by. And that is that if we knew a thief was coming to rob our house, we're not going anywhere. We're going to sit and wait on him till he comes. Or, at best, we're going to call for law enforcement help. So they'll be there to assist us. And in the meantime, you know what we do? We lock our doors and we set our alarms and we do all the deterrents that are necessary should the thief decide that he wants to break in? Because we don't know when a thief is coming, but we prepare ourselves nonetheless. Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2, 2 Peter 3 verse 10 says that the one that we're talking about tonight that is coming again, it's coming as a thief in the night. No, he's not a thief. He defeated the thief, but it's coming as a thief when we least expect it, when we don't know. So it only makes sense, man. If we don't know when a thief is coming, break into our house or into our car, but we prepare nonetheless. We don't know the prophetic timetable. We don't know when that trumpet's going to sound. We don't know when Jesus is coming again. So we prepare ourselves every day for this coming. Now, by the way, before we really get involved in this thing tonight, when I speak of the soon return of Christ, I'm talking about two parts. Part number one is when Jesus comes for his church. Write this package down and read it later. For Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18, speaks of what the Bible calls the rapture of the church. And that's when Jesus steps out in the clouds, a trumpet sounds, and as I said a moment ago, we blast off to see Jesus. But then there's part two, to the soon return of Christ. That's when he comes with his church, as Revelation 19 tells us, in what is called the second return. The Lord's been to earth one time, and he's coming back again to establish his kingdom on earth. But watch this, either part. I don't care whichever part you're talking about. There's no day, there's no date, there's no time, there's no hour given to anyone as to when Jesus Christ is coming again. So the $64,000 question is, if nobody knows when he's coming, why do so many think they know? Blows me away, Brother Keith. So many think they know when Jesus is coming. I'm going to say this one more time. Look at that 36th verse again. By the way, do you know what color my 36th verse is in my Bible? It's red. Do you know who's talking? You got it. Jesus is talking. Matthew's not talking here. Jesus is talking. Watch the language. He says, nobody knows. Not the angels in heaven. Watch this, watch this, watch this. But my Father only. Brother Keith, I love the word only in the Greek. You know what it means? Only. My Father only. No, my Father only knows. But if that doesn't just grab your heart, Miss Ruthie put up the verse on the next screen. Watch what this says. Mark 13, 32, Jesus stoked somebody else in the mix. Watch this, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not the angels, nor the Son, S-O-N, but my Father only. 
according to Mark 13, 32. And that might be the first time you've ever seen that. And that verse blows you away, don't it? Because Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming. Now, I know that's hard to believe. We've been taught forever. John 10 says that I and my Father are one. We've been taught in John chapter 1, and we said it yesterday, that God put on human flesh and came to this earth to die on the sins of the world, for the sins of the world. We said this yesterday, that when Jesus was on this planet, he was 100% God and 100% man. I mean, and I believe that, and I shall forever believe that. And there is no verse that contradicts any other verse in the Word of God. So ladies and gentlemen, look, I don't quite understand that 32nd verse, but I accept that 32nd verse because it's in the Bible. By the way, do you think you got to know everything? No, you don't have to know everything. In fact, if you knew everything, guess who, guess who you'd be? Yeah, you'd be him. And ladies and gentlemen, let's just chalk it up. It is a mystery. Now, I will point this out to you. Even though Jesus was 100% God, do you know there was one attribute that Jesus did not have when he was on this planet? Jesus was not omnipresent. Jesus was confined to a body. Everywhere Jesus went, he went by foot or he went by beast of burden. You remember when Martha, Martha got ticked off at him, didn't he? When he found out two days before her brother died, but didn't show up until four days after. And boy, she was super upset when Jesus said he was late. By the way, Jesus wasn't late, okay? He's never been late. He's always been on time. That's another sermon for another day. But there's at least one attribute Jesus didn't have. He wasn't omnipresent. And then know this. Don't have time to turn to it. Write it down. Read it later. John 15, 15 says, the master doesn't always tell the servant everything. The servant doesn't know all the time what the master tells him. So watch this. I'm assuming, pastor, that the father has held this information from the son. He's going to turn to him one day and say, son, go get my children. Now, do you have a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. You know why? Because I'm one of the children he's coming to get. I just want him to get me. Amen? I don't care that he knows now. I don't care that he knows tomorrow. I don't have a problem with that. Here's what I have a problem with. I have a problem if G well, like so many prophecy experts and so many date setters see, they know something Jesus doesn't even know. I've been hearing them all my life. You've heard them before. When Pastor and I were teenagers growing up, at the First Baptist Church in Valerica, Brother Keith, do you remember the Henry Kissinger syndrome? And all the prophecy experts thought Henry Kissinger was going to be the Antichrist. Now, for you that don't know who Henry Kissinger is, or was, uh, he's still alive, by the way. I think he's like 97 years old. Do you know that Henry Kissinger was the former Secretary of State of the Nixon and Ford administration? And I don't remember anything about Henry Kissinger. He had this innate ability wherever he went to bring peace to the most troubled regions in the world. Iran and Iraq. And in 1973, Mr. Kissinger was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his contribution to end the Vietnam War. Well, if you know anything about prophecy, you know when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be Mr. Peace. But it's going to be a false peace. It's going to be a temporary peace for a little while, and then he's going to turn on the nation and lead them into the final battle of all, called the Battle of Armageddon. But anyway, these prophecy experts, back when Brother Keith and I were teenagers in the 70s, these prophecy experts says, this has got to be the Antichrist. Everywhere he goes, there's peace. Besides, in Mr. Kissinger's last name, if you add up all the numeric value of his last name, K being the 11th letter, and I being the 9th letter, and S being the 9th letter, and you have all those up together. Do you know what you get? You get 111. If you multiply that by 6, you get 666. The number of the fat prophet and beast of the great tribulation period. Aha! Mr. Kissinger has to be the Antichrist. Besides, here's what they said. In his last name is the word sin. S-I-N. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll make you the Antichrist. Do you know in my last name, Coram, C-O-R-A-M, is the word ram? Pastor, I'm expecting any days to go horns out of the side of my head or become a Dodge pickup truck. Amen. Amen. Isn't it silly and amazing what these guys will do to sell a book or go on some speaking circuit? But guess what? The Kissinger thing died, but the prophecy experts did not. 
and they eyeballed the 80s and they said, we've got a new prophecy date. We've got a new prophecy idea for everybody. Here's what they did. I don't plan on spending a lot of time here, but because you have your Bibles open in Matthew 24, watch this. They centered on verses 32 through 35. Now that's just above where we just read. It's called the parable of the fig tree. Can I tell you everything I know about the parable of the fig tree? And it isn't much, but I promise you there's nothing else to add to it. Watch this. According to the Bible, the parable of the fig tree means this. The fig tree represented Israel. Where it says in verse 32, when her leaves begin to bud and her branches become tender, you'll know that summer is near. Let me stop right there. They're just saying whenever you walk by a fig tree, you know in summer if her branches are full of leaves and if her branch is tender. Now that's all that means. And then they speak of the word generation in verse 34. And here's what the parable of the fig tree means. That that generation that witnesses the signs because when the branch turns tender and it's full of leaves, that is a symbolic picture of the signs that are going to appear. Watch this, that say that the Lord's coming is near. And the generation that witnesses those signs coming to place is, is just what it says. They're just going to watch it happen. Now, look, that's all that parable means. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. But not according to the so-called prophecy experts. Here's what they said in the 80s. They said, no, the parable of the fig tree means this. The fig tree represents the nation of Israel being reborn. Yet he was reborn. May 14th, 1948, you watch your history, read your history. It really happened, okay? That part happened. But they said that the parable of the fig tree represents, watch this, when Israel is reborn as a nation. And the generation that watches that happen will see the Lord's return. That's not what that passage says. In fact, the passage, if you look at verse 33, the word is near, N-E-A-R. It's not H-E-R-E. It's not talking about Jesus being here. It's talking about his prophecy is near. And then they made a grave mistake. They said that word generation means 40 years. It absolutely does not mean that. That word generation means a span of time. It's nothing specific. But here's what the prophecy experts did. They got out their calculators. And Brother Keith, they added 1948 and added 40 years, and they said Jesus has to come by 1988. Bingo, just like that. Do y'all know what happened in 1988? Edgar, we didn't go. That's right. We're still here. Amen. Do you know what happened in 1988? Edgar Wiseman, a NASA engineer, wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why We'll Be Raptured Away in 1988. Sold 4.0 million copies. And here's what the nut said. Only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. Well, Eddie, you're wrong. Because the Bible is never in error. Brother Keith, I remember that day because he gave a date for the takeoff. September 11th, 1988. Wow, another infamous September 11th date. Do you know what September 11th, 1988 was? It was a Sunday. I was a pastor of a church in Orlando. Brother Keith, we were running about 300 and we were blowing and going. But on that day, September 11th, 1988, Rapture Sunday, we had about 500 people show up. We put chairs up where put them in the hall, we put them outside, we put speakers outside. I reckon that people thought, well, if we're going to be raptured today, I ought to be in church. I got news for you. You can be in church when the trumpet sounds. If you don't know the Lord of the church, you ain't going anywhere. Amen. Amen. And guess what? The day came and the day went. Nothing happened. And those 150, 200 extra people that came that day, they didn't show up next Sunday. They didn't come the next Sunday. And we were back to business as usual. So you'd think Eddie would take his $4.5 million sales and he'd go to some island somewhere. But that's not what Eddie did. Eddie wrote a second book. I've got it in my library. It's called On Bought the Time. And the first sentence of that second book said, I made an error. I said that there are 88 reasons why the Lord's going to rapture us in 1988. He said, but I have discovered there's 89 reasons why we're going to be raptured in 1989. Pastor, I waited for the trilogy, the third book, 90 reasons why I'm a big dummy, but I never found it in my bookstores anywhere. 
And pretty soon Eddie went away. You would think that the so-called prophets, the experts went away, but they said, oh, no, no, we made another error. Oh, really? Here's what they said. A generation's not 40 years, it's 70 years. We had 70 to 1948. We got 2018. We took seven years off for the rapture because the rapture happens, and then there's a seven-year tribulation period. We're going to be raptured away in 2011. Y'all remember what happened in 2011? His name was Harold Camping. He's the president of, was the president of Family Radio Christian Network. Here's what he said. Without any shadow of a doubt, we'll be raptured away on Saturday, May 21st, 2011. And he gave a time for the event. He said it's going to be 6.30 in the evening. My wife and I were vacationing in New York City at the time. And we were coming out of Central Park. And I grabbed my phone. I said, honey. I said, it's 5 o'clock. If we're going to get a full belly before the rapture, we get to the restaurant because we only got an hour and a half. And my wife knows me. She said, Ron, you're making fun, aren't you? And I said, you bet I'm making fun because a guy like Carol Kempe deserves to be made fun of and anybody else that, that sets a date. Do you know, Brother Keith, if somebody picked the right date, God would just change it, wouldn't he? Just to mess with their mind. So look this way. Listen to this way. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you when Jesus is coming again? As if you see, here it comes, fresh off the press. He's coming when his father tells him to come. Not before. And not with some Yahoo who does not know anything about what he's talking about. Because I want to tell you what we believe in O'Brien Baptist Church. What Ron Corn believes is he preaches this country Sunday in and Sunday out. We believe the Bible. And the Bible says we're in the church age. And you know what happens in the church age? Well, the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. He birthed the church. And when you got saved, you became a part of the church. And you and I have one commission. And that is to take this gospel and win the loss to Jesus Christ and tell the good news of Jesus Christ. And after they make that, that after they make that great decision for Christ and they are baptized, we are told to do what? Make disciples out of them so that they can make disciples Tell somebody about Jesus and make disciples out of them. And ladies and gentlemen, if we appear to be aggressive, it's because we don't know how long we have to do this. Time is of the essence. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time because I'm going to tell you the best that I understand it. This is what I believe that's going to happen. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is a trumpet. It might happen before Ron Corn gets to preaching. The best that I understand it. It might happen tomorrow. It might happen before this revival is over. And when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first. They've, their souls and spirit have been in heaven. Their body's going to join their soul and spirit. God's going to give them a brand new body just like his. And if all of those who are alive, and I've always thought of myself, Brother Keith, as we that are alive, I may not be, I may be one of the dead in Christ, but I'm going to tell you what, after the dead in Christ rise, we which are alive, we're out of here, and the church age is done. And you know what happens after that? Daniel 12, 1 says, a time of trouble such you have never seen before. You think we got problems now, you ain't seen nothing yet, man. And the Bible says there's a seven-year period of time called the Great Tribulation period. Matthew 24 only speaks of it a little bit. I'm not going to spend any time here. Matthew 15, uh, verse 15 in Matthew 24, 15 and following talks about it. The word tribulation is found in verse 21. Do you know what it means? A pressure of affliction. It will be an awful time. And after seven years, it culminates with a final battle called the Battle of Armageddon. We've been in heaven for seven years. Pastor Keith, I'm assuming the judgment seat of Christ happens at that time and we stand before Jesus and we get ready and we come back on white horses with Jesus. It's going to take seven years for me to know how to learn how to ride a white horse. I don't care if it's black or brown, man. I don't know how to ride one. And so I'm going to be looking forward to learning how. And I ride with Jesus. And he takes us over the Kidron Valley. And he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah 14.4 comes to, to pass where the uh, Mount of Olives will split in half. And he'll take us through the split into the Eastern Gate, into the brand new Jerusalem where we shall live with Jesus forevermore. And that's what the Bible says. I've been to the Holy Land on two occasions and I'd love to go back for a third time to see the old Jerusalem one more time before I see the new Jerusalem. But can you imagine taking a trip to the Holy Land with Jesus as our guide? 
And he takes us through the eastern gate into the brand new Jerusalem. By the way, the Sunni Muslims sealed the eastern gate in 1541 under their leader Saladin. Do you know why they sealed the gate shut? So Jesus and his church couldn't get in. Oh yeah, that's going to stop him, Brother Keith. Yeah, they're going to seal the gate and that's going to stop him. By the way, isn't that amazing? Islam doesn't even believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't believe he's coming back a second time. But just in case, we're going to seal the gate shut. And then they had kind of a double reinforcement. They put a cemetery in front because the Islam faith believes that a man cannot have anything to do with death, can't touch death, can't defile himself with death. But I promise you the one that overcome death, hell, and the grave ain't going to have any problem going through into the New Jerusalem where we will be forevermore. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know when he's coming. I just know that he's coming. And verse 42 reminds us to stand ready. Be ready because we don't know the time or the hour. Ready or not, here he comes. So first of all, the first thing we want to learn about the soon return of Christ is that nobody knows when he's coming. So you know when you need to get ready? Right now, right now, right now. Because you don't know when. Second thing that we want to talk about the soon return of Christ is that not only does no one know when he's coming, no one sign declares that he's coming. There's not one sign that point to and say, that's it, the Lord's got to come. No, not one sign. Look at the sign in verse number 37. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What in the world does that mean, Brother Ron? Well, you got to understand the whole chapter of Matthew. It begins in verse 1. Jesus is teaching the disciples on the Mount of Olives. If you've ever seen a, 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 a picture of Israel on television, either through Christian television or, or you're watching some uh, a documentary on the land of Israel, you know that beautiful gold dome rock? Well, that is the most picturesque view. And that's where the disciples were looking in verse number one. Now, it's not there now, but Herod's temple was there. Herod's temple, a most magnificent structure back in the day. Brother Keith, they tell me it was white marble. They tell me that the columns in front of Herod's temple were so huge, so magnificent, so glorious, that if you and I and Seth and, and Tony and, 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 and Dwayne, we all got together and we held hands, and we went around the column. The last two guys still wouldn't be touching fingertips. It was that massive. And I don't know what happened on this particular day, but maybe the sun ricocheted off of that white marble. And one of the disciples said, Lord, look at that. Isn't that magnificent? Can I tell you our Lord wasn't impressed? And if you don't believe me, look at verse 2. Matthew 24, he says, Really? There's coming a day, gonna, it's going to be a pile of rubble. Do you know what our Lord was talking about? He was talking about a moment in time, about 40 years from that moment, because Matthew chapter 24 is about 30 A.D., and 40 years from that moment, Titus invaded Jerusalem. And according to the church historian, Josephus, he leveled the town so much that Jerusalem was unrecognizable as a city. And the Lord said, that's magnificent. Pretty soon it's going to be a pile of rubble. I feel a sermon coming on. You don't mind if I preach it, do you? Our Lord is not impressed with an outward show, but an inward glow. Brother Keith, you have done a magnificent job with this sanctuary. And please, what I'm about to say does not refute that. But our Lord is not most impressed with a beautiful sanctuary that has stained glass and, and carpet and a beautiful sound system. Now, you know what our Lord is impressed with most? The real church. The real church that's alive. The real church that has power. The real church that worships him in spirit and in truth. Not a retake of the moon, the night of the living dead, but a church that moves with excitement. So I'm going to preach for a moment, okay? Maybe you were baptized as an infant. Maybe you walked an aisle like Brother Ron did at age nine and they filled out a card on you and you became a member of the church. But there was never a change within can I tell you, Jesus doesn't care what we look like on the outside, but who we are on the inside and who we are when the Lord Jesus comes in is he changes us by the power of God. So that's what Jesus thought about this beautiful structure that would be the power of rubble. What must have disturbed the disciples because in verse 3 they said, well, tell us what the sign shall be of your soon coming. 
The disciples often asked Jesus that question, and sometimes Jesus would deflect them, and sometimes he would ignore them, but Jesus just kicks the door in, and he just answers them. And beginning in verse number four, he begins to give them signs of the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about a couple of these signs. So he talked about all of them in one city. I'm going to talk about a couple of them, but I want to just tell you, I'm careful about following signs. Because you've got people, Brother Keith, that are seeking signs instead of seeking a Savior. And let me just tell you about signs. They're exciting to read about. They're exciting to talk about. We talked that day for two and a half hours, those guys sitting around that lunch table, about all the signs of the soon return of Christ. But they're attention grabbers and reminders at best. You know, like a National Enquirer story. I looked out my bedroom window. I saw Jesus sitting on a John Deere tractor, and he was carving a message in my grass. Weirdos, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Proclaiming signs might be dramatic, but the purpose of why these signs are here is the eye-catching part, because watch what happened. In verses 4 through 7, Jesus gives signs. In verses 9 through 12, he gives some more signs. But can I tell you the breaking news of the whole 24th chapter is that 8th verse. And if you look at that 8th verse, notice Matthew 24 says all these signs are the beginning of sorrows. Brother Ron, what in the world does that mean? Well, the word sorrows have to do with the travail of a woman in childbearing. And we all know that when a lady gets the news that she's going to become a mom, it's exciting news and everybody's thrilled for her. And then all of a sudden there's physiological changes and there's emotional changes and there's morning sickness and there's discomfort. Like I got any clue what you women go through during childbearing. I'm sorry, but ladies, you are my heroes. I just want you to know that, okay? I was in this afternoon and my mom went back to the birth of my son. I didn't take any birth classes or mom's classes back in the day because of the very productive part of the Keith that noticed a film. And the film went something like this. So let me she's going, yes, I got a baby boy, baby girl. And I thought, that ain't going to be any problem, man. I got this taken care of. So I didn't go to the rest of the classes. But I take you to that day that my wife was in labor for 48 hours with a baby boy that she eventually delivered at 10 pounds, okay? And all I heard as I was with her in that waiting room or that room that where she was and she was doing a lot of <laughs> but she was also screaming at the top of her lungs man it was like <laughs> and she did that for like 45 minutes can I tell you the best news of all is when the doctor came in and he said Mr. Corn, we're going to have to do a c-section you're going to have to leave and I said hallelujah boy I could use a Dr. Pepper man oh <laughs> Boy, Ron, you did a great job today. I don't know why I got off on to all that. It's too late now. But anyway, ladies, here's watch this, watch this, watch this. And now we come to the time of your delivery. And we know one thing. The pains become more numerous, more consistent, more intense. And they go from 10 minutes to 5 minutes to 3 minutes. And all of a sudden, the little baby is born. Now watch this. Jesus said that's how the signs are going to be. You're going to see a sign, and then you'll see a sign, and then there won't be anything for the longest time, and you'll see a sign, and then there'll be nothing for the longest time, and then you'll see a sign, and then nothing, and then you'll see a sign, and then all of a sudden you'll start seeing sign, 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 and then all of a sudden here's a sign, there's a sign everywhere, a sign, and there's an explosion of signs, and the next thing you know, the Lord Jesus Christ has come again. I remind you that the page you're looking at, Jesus was talking 2,000 years ago, and the signs haven't changed on the page. But they have not, even though they haven't changed in number, they've changed in noise. Because all of a sudden in 2020, Matthew 24, in my prediction, and I'm not setting a date, is knocking at the door. And Jesus is getting ready to come. And the pains are now 10 minutes and 7 minutes and 5 minutes apart. And before you know it, the Lord Jesus comes. Now I don't have time to go over all these signs. In fact, I'm going to leave the big boys out. We're not going to talk about wars and rumors of war. We're not going to talk about earthquakes. By the way, do you know that last Sunday, 
There was an earthquake quake in North Carolina. 5.1 on the Richter scale. Small boy, but still an earthquake nonetheless. Went halfway around the world in Indonesia somewhere. It was in North Carolina. But we're not going to talk about earthquakes. We're not going to talk about the economy. I want to just give you a few of the signs that are knocking at our door in 2020. Look at verse number 7. You see the word pestilences? The word means disease. In fact, because it's plural, the word means diseases. Oh, boy. Haven't we had an education about that word lately? But can I just tell you, as unprecedented as COVID-19 is, it's all everybody wants to talk about for the last six months. It's not the only pestilence mentioned here in Matthew chapter 24. The word is plural, and there were many before, and there shall be many, many thereafter. Do you know that there was a, a flu influenza in 1918 that killed 50 million people? There was a polio virus in the 30s and the 40s that attacked great men like my father, and Franklin Roosevelt. I remember the 80s and 90s. Oh, yes, you do. It was called what? The X virus. <laughs> and that's that plague. Don't turn to it. But Revelation 6 verse 8 says in the tribulation period, there's going to be a pestilence that has the power to kill one-fourth of the earth. And if you do your math, if it was to happen tonight, that would be two billion people that shall die. I don't know. My COVID stays here that long. Oh, until it takes 2 billion people. But I'm just telling you that COVID has woken a lot of people up. That's wonderful. That's great. But it's just one of the signs. But it's a sign nevertheless. Look at verse number 10. Many will be offended. That word means to trip or stumble. Look at the rest of that verse. They will betray one another and hate one another. Guys, have you seen people with anger issues like you've seen in 2012? I've never seen so many people so angry in all my life. I pulled up to a gas station the other day and I'm putting gas in my car and a man pulls up and I said, good morning. He said, what's so good about it? And he opened up his door and he cussed out three of his children. I think the oldest one might have been seven years old. And the whole time, Brother Keith, I'm going, gas, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Because I'm thinking, man, he may just shoot me because I asked him. Uh, I, great day. I made the statement, great day. I was at the doctor's office three, three weeks ago just getting a checkup. And you know, doctor's offices are, 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 are different these days. And I had to wait outside because there was too many people in the waiting area. So I had to wait outside. Now, you know what? It was 112 degrees in the shade and, and the line got to be long. And I'm going to tell you what, Ron Corn behaved himself. Hands up before holy God. I behaved my eyes. The only one in the group there that did not cuss. I was the only group in the person in the group that behaved themselves. And they were, oh, that, this, is, this is just horrible. Oh, my God. You know what this is? And I'll never forget what a man said. The man standing in all that heat, he said, this is persecution. That's what it is. And I thought, no, waiting in a line is inconvenience. It's not persecution. Running out of toilet paper during the COVID crisis in the early days might have seemed like persecution, but it was an inconvenience. Brother Keith, a pastor called me last week and was crying. He said, Brother Ron, a family just left my church. And they were a great family. You know why they left my church? Because one of their loved ones was in the hospital and I didn't go visit them. Didn't they get the memo? We can't go to the hospital. I mean, I don't know if some hospitals have released that, but I wonder if doctors are even seeing the patients, man, and that's nothing against doctors. And then the mask. I know it's a controversial thing, and I don't love masks. You know why I don't love masks? Because I wasn't born with one. And they're a little uncomfortable to me. And as you can tell, I, I do a lot of sweating, and, and, and I, I, I just don't like the mask. But you know what? If a sign on the door says, put your mask on, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my mask on, okay? Because Romans 13 says that we are citizens of not only another world, we're citizens of this world, and we got to be good citizens. And if they make it mandatory, you have to stop at a red light, you got to wear a mask, okay? It just, it's just part of... The game. Y'all hear about the lady in April in Flint, Michigan, that went to Dollar General store, and the security guard said, "Ma'am, you got to leave. You got to put a mask on. You got to put a mask on, or you have to leave." She left all right, got her boyfriend, and came back with a, with a gun and killed the security officer dead because how dare he tell her to wear a mask? Folks, put a mask on. Guys, you get to advertise your favorite football team. And that might be the only cheering we get to do all year. Just think, ladies, don't have to put any makeup on to go to Walmart. Hey, Amen. I see that hand back there. 
So look, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get you to understand we're living in a day when everybody is angry. And the Bible said they would be. Look at verse number 12, lawlessness will abound. You ever seen such rebellion in all your life? Spilled over in the street. Brother Keith and I used to preach about rebellion in the school and rebellion in the home. But Everybody's just angry, and it's the guys in the blue that are responsible. By the way, this has nothing to do with gun control. I, I, I'm not going to get political, but I've just got to tell you this. The fact since 2013, there have been more people killed by the loaded gun than there have been days during that time. And by the way, so you want to know how the evangelist believes about gun control, you can take every gun away from every human being, and they'll find a way to kill one another with spitballs. Because the trouble's not in the gun cabinet, the trouble's right here in the heart. But ladies and gentlemen, the people have lost their ever of mind. And there's lawlessness. And then look at verse 12, the last phrase, the love of many will wax cold. That word cold speaks of an attitude of apathy. The people no longer care about themselves, uh, about others, but only care about themselves. When they lose the passion for everything else but who they are. Now I can go back to verse 37 so I can finish with point two and go to point three. Do you need me, sweetie? Okay. Preach too long. Well, you knew better than to say that. I was really God bless you. Back to verse 37 where it all started. Jesus said, right before I come, we'll return to the days of Noah. What were those days like? I just told you. Violence, lawlessness, hatred. Do you know that people were so evil in those days that God started all over again with the human race? But I want you to see something. I go to point three. Be there now in a second. We're going to see. What's this? Jesus points out one thing about the days of Noah. It's found in verse 38. For in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And it's that same cold attitude that we're talking about. None of those things in verse 38 are evil, but these people were so preoccupied with themselves that they didn't even think about God. I know we're on coronavirus overload. But I said it a little bit yesterday, and I'm going to just say it again. You know what I'm? I, I, you know what the coronavirus has helped me do? First of all, it's helped me stay home with the woman that I love. And guys, if I've got to explain that to you, we'll talk after the service. But I've enjoyed that part. But I have missed too many church too many church services. I I have been in front of a microphone in an empty building, and I've had revivals cancel on me. And, I have missed being with God's people in God's house on God's day. But I got news for you. The coronavirus didn't suddenly send everybody back to the house. They were going to the house long before the coronavirus hit. This man right here, the first revival that I preached, we went to First Baptist Church, Dowling Park. You remember that for an annual meeting? And this man quoted a statistic that I sat in my seat and I shuddered. When Keith Jones said... That the newest statistic is 17 Southern Baptist churches were closing their doors every week because of inactivity. People were drifting from God's house long before the pandemic. And we ought to fall back in love with going to church, but then it hit me, Pastor. This church isn't going to be here. It might be here in a building, but this church isn't going to be here forever. And if a trumpet sounds during this service, if you're left behind, and God forbid, but you might as well turn the lights off and lock the doors because we're not coming back. And you need to understand something. Nobody knows when he's coming. No one sign declares that it's coming. But we're not looking for signs. We're looking for someone. And that brings me to the third thing, and we're done. Nobody knows when he's coming. There's not one sign that declares he's coming. And finally, nothing changes concerning his coming. Nothing changes. He's still coming. Nothing changes. 
Brother Keith, in this amazing Olivet Discourse, my favorite verse is verse 25. Six little words. See, I told you beforehand. <laughs> When the coronavirus hit, God didn't start walking all over the streets of gold, pacing. He's always had a plan. And plan number one was to send his son to die for the sins of the world. And plan number two was to send his son back to rule and to reign. And that has not changed. You ever watch the news? You watch it long enough, you'll lose your mind. And I watched it the other day, and I won't give you the call letters of the cable network. You'll probably be able to figure it out. But Chicken Little was a news anchor, and the sky was falling. And then he went to a break, and he said this. Suppose a major hurricane came during the pandemic. I thought, dude, why don't we just get in boats and go out in the middle of the ocean and all jump overboard? I mean, what are you doing? But wait just a minute, that other news channel that's so popular and because it always gives good news, be careful, because everything in the earth isn't hunky-dory. Do you understand? You ever been to a Chinese restaurant? The fortune cookie never says that your house is about to get demolished by a hurricane. It's always something positive. So let me just close the message this way. I'd rather read this news. And this news says that Jesus Christ is coming again and nothing's going to stop him. The war's not going to stop him. Pandemic's not going to stop him. People fussing and fighting with one another's not going to stop him. Wimping out and flaking out, that's not going to stop him. He's still coming. And when he comes, he is not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over. And the wonderful news is he will wipe away all tears from our eyes. And there'll be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain. Because the former things will pass away and he's going to make all things new. Watch this. I've read the end of the book and we win. Both sides win. Watch this. Both sides. I, I said there's two people. Do you know what the Church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be doing in light of his coming? Still doing what you've been doing. Occupy until I come, Jesus said. So keep winning and keep serving and keep praising as we sing about tonight. Keep coming and listening to the, to the Word of God and feed on the Word of God. And you know how you win the other group? You accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. He's not returning for religious veneer. He's returning for redeemed souls. So accept Him. When I pastored my first church, my son was two years old. And I don't know at what point it was, Brother Keith, but he might have been three, it doesn't matter. But he fell asleep on whatever pew he was sitting on, sitting with his mom, while his daddy was preaching. And after the service, we kind of fellowshiped around with one another. And mama went to the house, which was just 50 yards across the way in the pastorium. And I was visiting with somebody, and the janitor turned the lights off and locked the doors. And I went home, and she's on the phone, <clears throat> so I just hung out. Probably got a Dr. Pepper, and we were just having a good time, just kind of sitting in the easy chair, letting a busy day of preaching just kind of subside and try to grab a breath and relax. And Mama came in the living room, hung up the phone, came in the living room, and said, where's Ronnie, my son? And I said, I thought he was with you. So the 50 yards between the house and the church for the Keith, I read it like in three seconds flat. And I unlocked the door. I expected when I opened the door for my son to be wailing and gnashing his teeth. And he was still sleeping away. But years later, I'll be driving, and that scene will pop into my head. The best I understand, that when the rapture sounds, Christians in cars will vacate. And the cars will drive themselves until they don't drive anymore. And pilotless planes will fly as those pilots that are born again will go. And it'll be an awful time. And then if you survive all that, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you're going to be left behind. And I'm not trying to be dramatic here. And I'm not trying to get you to just pay attention, but you need to pay attention. 
Because if you come here tomorrow night, if you're lost without Christ and the rapture has happened during the day, I, Brother Ron's not coming because I can't come because I'm going to be with Jesus. And so we were pastor and Miss Debbie and we just go on down the line. And the way to fix that is to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because he's still coming. Can we bow our heads all over the building? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, the best I knew how, as quick as I knew how, so we wouldn't be here all night because we covered an entire chapter. I wanted to tell you the best that I understood about the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The invitation is the same. The altars are open. Maybe there's something that you think you need to be doing in light of this news. Would you come down here and ask the one that knows? Somebody shared this with me yesterday after the service. Brother Ron, would you pray for me that God would speak to my heart this week so I will know exactly what I need to do. Now, I know what I need to do. I need to serve him, but I need some specifics. The altars are open. On the very first one, you can come right now if you want to do business with the Lord. But I promise you, that other group, and maybe nobody in here is a member of that other group, but you need to be ready, and you get ready when you trust in Jesus as your Savior. He died to save you. He rose to live in you. Would you make that decision tonight for him? The pastor will be standing down front. Would you leave your seat and come and say, Pastor, I need to get saved. Keith Jones will tell you exactly how to do that. Lord Jesus, I was so excited that day that my brothers gathered with me as we talked about your coming. I don't know why the coronavirus is here, and I don't know why we're doing what we're doing, and I don't know what your mind is all about with this stuff. Maybe you've taken the privilege away from us to be in God's house so we would fall back in love with it. You know, the old adage, we don't know how special it is till it's taken away. I don't know what you're up to, Lord. But I know you're still coming. And I know you want us to be about your business. So I pray we'll leave here different than when we came in the door. I pray that we would be ready, as 1 Peter 3 says, to give an answer for the hope that's within us when we're asked tomorrow. So what is this pandemic all about? And you'll say, well, you ask for it, you get it. And you just tell them the story of Jesus. Because it's part of the signs of his soon return. I pray that tonight you would do what you need to do to bring honor and glory to the Lord and sufficiency to yourself and that that empty need will be met, whatever that need is. And we thank you because it's in Jesus' name I pray.